you and uh, do hope that you enjoy this short act of worship today, Wednesday at Crowhurst. The Lord is here, his spirit so is, is with us. us. We meet in the presence of God who knows our needs, he hears our cries, he feels our pain, and he heals our wounds. Well, most of us will have times when we feel a bit down, days when we can't hear the bird song or smell the roses or even recognise that the sky is blue. Sometimes that's hard to shake off, isn't it? Sometimes, sometimes whacking on a bit of worship music um, will do the trick and lift our spirits. Sometimes it might need a trip to the doctors for a bit of expert advice because what started out as a blue day has turned into an extended period of depression. Maybe brought on by a bereavement or something else. Whatever it is, most of us will know how difficult it can be to lift ourselves out of the doldrums and to look on the bright side. Yeah. And a pep talk in the mirror is not going to do it, is it? Mm -hmm. I've tried it, believe me, it doesn't work. <laughs> Physical exercise can help with mental well-being, and it's certainly better to go for a walk than it is to indulge in that extra piece of chocolate or a glass <laughs> of wine for a quick fix. Again, uh, I know, I've tried it. <laughs> But as Christians, we can experience another layer of difficulty, I think. We can feel guilty about our low mood, knowing that we live in a wealthy country with freedom and friends and family and neighbours and, you know, maybe life is going well and Jesus is at the centre of everything. Christians aren't supposed to get depressed, are they? But did you know that clinical depression is as prevalent among believers as it is among non-believers? If you don't believe me, you can check the statistics. Unfortunately, in some church cultures, there is an underlying pressure that we must always give the appearance of being happy and never let people know <laughs> that we're struggling. Jan's written a brilliant book about it. She gave it to me last week. Fantastic testimony. But I want to call that out that notion that Christians must always be happy for the lie that it is. Jesus never said he wanted us to be happy. That is not the message of the gospel. Jesus wants us to be whole. And uh, places like Crowhurst exist to help people get the emotional and the physical healing that they need. And it may not happen overnight. It may be a slow process, but the result of that healing is a joy-filled life something so much deeper than happiness, which is in itself quite a transient thing. But perhaps wonderfully mood swings are not something that really uh, bother you. And yet right now you are deeply perplexed by the state of the world. Everything seems out of control and uncertain. What is God doing? People are suffering and dying, possibly people we know. People are living in fear. And some people are behaving recklessly, which is causing us alarm or even anger. It's hardly surprising if many of us are feeling anxious. It's when we're unable to control our circumstances that um, the, the circumstances that affect us personally, that we are at our most helpless. And ironically, that's, it's also a time like that when we recognise our greatest dependence on God yeah. and we're reminded of his faithfulness and his grace and love. The Old Testament is remarkably honest, isn't it, about feelings of anxiety and depression, con confusion and consternation. Where are you, God? What's going on? And we talked um, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about one of the Psalms and also the book of 1 Kings may well be familiar to you as places for you to turn to when you're feeling a bit low and you, you just want to be in that place with God in his word. But how about the prophet Jeremiah? Probably not your first thought. 
After all, he's got a reputation for being a bit of, um, well, a bit of a Jeremiah, really. <laughs> a person who's a complete pessimist about the present and who foresees a calamitous future. In other words, a prophet of doom. His lengthy book in the Bible is not for the faint-hearted. It's doom and gloom from start to finish. And if you didn't feel bad when you started reading it, <laughs> you probably will at the end of it. But the shorter book of Lamentations, part of which we're going to look at in a moment, it has a real gem at the heart of it, which may well be familiar to you. And we're going to sing it in our first song now, our first hum. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. <laughs> and I'm using the New Living Translation. I'm the one who has seen the afflictions that come from the rod of the Lord's anger. He has led me into darkness, shutting out all light. He has turned his hand against me again and again, all day long. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. So it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. So may the Lord bring peace through his word today. Amen. Amen. Those wonderfully positive verses at the middle there of the reading are at the heart of this short book and they cast a shaft of light into an otherwise dark and desperate part of Israel's history. 
Only a few verses later, and Jeremiah is saying, streams of tears flow from my eyes because my people are destroyed. And what I see brings grief to my soul. The book of Lamentations was written by Jeremiah soon after the temple was destroyed in 586 BC. He equated the fall of Jerusalem with the sinfulness of Israel and the judgment of God. Though some might blame the wicked Nebuchadnezzar, as far as Jeremiah was concerned, the Hebrews brought it on themselves. The good news is that God would be with them to restore their homes and use their downfall to draw them back to himself. Well, some will be saying today that COVID-19 is God's judgment on the world. I, I don't think so. Although we should be prepared for disasters like this, even expect them. They are the consequences of sin. And the consequences come after choices have been made. Mm -hmm. And if there's one thing that you can count on in life, it's that there will be accidents and illnesses and unexpected tragedies. No one is immune. It's not a matter of if, but when. Mm -hmm. Our faith will be tested in this life on this earth. Yeah. But Christians believe that judgment will take place when Jesus returns. And we trust that God can and will use this pandemic for the good by bringing many into the kingdom before that day comes. Are we like Jeremiah weeping for our world? Do we have the compassion of God who longs to see all come to know and love him? What about those who've turned away from God or who've never known anything about a loving creator or redeemer, how can we best minister to them, to those around us who are anxious and depressed and worn down by the situation? I wonder how well we're prepared to walk alongside those who are searching for answers. And we do know that through the wonder of the internet, and Zoom church and all the different innovative things that are happening, people are coming to faith. Are we equipped and ready to help them with the message of lamentations? Jeremiah, Jeremiah reminds us that in the midst of darkness, the promises of God are still relevant, still valid and still true. Jeremiah consoles himself that the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. And he chooses to wait for the promise that comes with each new day. In this way, we can console others that there is hope. These verses can speak to us out of context, just as they spoke to Israel thousands of years ago. God's love, God's compassion, God's infinite mercy, are constant, unchanging and dependable. Something you can count on when everything around you seems to be falling apart. Yeah. This is what it means to believe in a sovereign God. God is with us. We are not alone. And God will be faithful in every situation and circumstance of life we face. All we need to do is turn to God and trust God and he will order and provide. Yeah. Of course, this does require a leap of faith. And in a moment of crisis or when people are in the throes of grief, it's not easy. It's hard to believe that God is with you when the rug is pulled out from under you. Mm -hmm. Yet, just as the sun comes up every morning, God pours out his love on us. And remember, even though there may be a thick layer of black cloud, blocking it from our view. We believe, don't we? We know that the sun is still there. In such a way, God is watching over us, even when he seems distant and far away. 
But when the Allied forces liberated Cologne, they found an inscription on the wall of a cellar where the Jews had been hiding from Nazi soldiers. It was and is an amazing affirmation of faith, written in the darkest of days. I believe in the sun even when it is not shining. I believe in love even when I cannot feel it. I believe in God even when he is silent. It is only when we internalise the wonderful promises of scripture that we can minister to others with the good news of Jesus Christ. The faithful love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. Amen. 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 So we turn to our second song, Faithful God. There were several I could have chosen for today to fit in with this reading, but let's turn our listening, our humming into praise and worship of our faithful God. to you from God our Father, who hears our cry. Peace from his Son, Jesus Christ, whose death brings healing. Peace from the Holy Spirit, who gives us life and strength. We go into the world to walk in God's light, to rejoice in God's love, and to reflect God's glory. Amen. Amen. 